This is Pen Dust Radio. Welcome, all you literati, you lovers of words and tales, you who need a break in your hurried, harried lives. We have a salve for your soul with stories imaginative and original. Short stories, riveting fiction, and wildly creative nonfiction. Pen Dust Radio. Definitely not the same old story. Please visit us at pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. We publish literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. Annie Lee Newton answered a Craigslist job post with a photo of herself drinking wine, a bold move that will eventually lead her to becoming a professional wine taster. This amusing memoir takes us along Annie Lee's journey to learn the intricate art of wine tasting. We travel with her to Mississippi, France, and Texas. We learn that place affects the taste of wine, both the place where the wine is made and where the wine is drunk. And we also learn that the secret to mastering wine tasting is, surprisingly, in learning to smell. Annie Lee Noon is a Houston-based writer and high school English teacher with an MFA in creative writing from Wesley University. She enjoys Oregon Pinot Noir with steak and Prosecco with pad thai. She has been known to complain about the over-the-top oakiness of California Chardonnay to anyone who will listen. This memoir is an essay from her nonfiction manuscript, The Sense of Taste. Wine Tasting Someone would inevitably walk across the room to ask me, So what did you think about the wine? Sometimes he was the professor of a class that I didn't take. Sometimes he was the older friend of the guy I was dating. And sometimes he was the father of an old roommate. But he was always a he. The first time the question flew at me, startling me into flailing my words and twisting up my face, I didn't know what to do with it. I think it's wine, red wine. Just what I asked for, I'd say. Why? What do you think about the wine? Then a stream of nonsensical words would pour over me, usually critical words bemoaning the quality of the wine available to a man of taste in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I came to understand wine tasting as a sham performance art, just another one of those struts in life meant to shore up a person's self-image. For the performance to be effective, the performer needed a person to engage with and to provide the excuse to use language and drink to fortify social standing. A sounding board, a funhouse mirror, a foil character. Wine tasting was part of the creation myth of certain types of identities. No one had ever expected me to be a foil character in wine tasting performances until I returned home to Mississippi after studying abroad in France. My months in Europe had given me an unexpected and undeserved credibility. It didn't matter that I pilfered most of my newfound European wine knowledge from the labels of inexpensive bottles. I was the girl who had been to a French vineyard. I was the girl who would now be talked to about wine. In Mississippi in those mid-aught days, Wine was either a musty status symbol used to bat words around, or it was the devil's drink that was illegal to sell anywhere but at a liquor store. The devil has always drunk well in Mississippi. People were ashamed to be seen at that one liquor store on Hardy Street. Even if the physical bodies of the devout could sneak unseen in and out of the store, a preacher or a layman might pass by and see your car parked in front. Come next Sunday, the tiniest, oldest lady at the Methodist church would be putting a donut in your hand and asking if everything was all right between you and God. In a mind-boggling tribute to all the complexity that makes up humanity, some of the very people who skirted past the door of the liquor store would later throw down the social gauntlet and pontificate about the taste of wine. 
Echo Domani is the Walmart of Italian wines. I once heard such a person sneer with pitch-perfect contempt. You would never have known that he shopped for groceries every Saturday morning at the Walmart down on Highway 49, just like the rest of us. My brother Josh was the one who gave me the tools I needed to cope with the question, and what do you think of this wine, Annie? He was a chef, and he had learned how to navigate the wine question long ago. He used an original technique that I called the wine mad lib. I have a rotating list of words that I arrange in a certain way, Josh explained. You just have to find words to match these three things, the bouquet, the current, and the aftertaste. You could say that the bouquet is complex because the earthy current contrasts with the lemony aftertaste, for example. You'll blow them away. The next time someone asked me what I thought about a glass of wine, I told them that the bouquet was refreshing, the current was fruity, and the aftertaste was tart. He agreed with me. For the first time, I felt a triumphant glow from winning the wine tasting game. I began to collect words to use to fill in the mad lib blanks for Josh's faux wine snob formula. My nouns were particularly adventurous. I declared that wines tasted of mushrooms, steak, molasses, and pine needles to whichever inquiring he was interested at the moment. My fruits were mostly taken from starburst flavors, watermelon, mango, strawberry. Depending on how much wine I'd actually drunk and how mischievous I felt, sometimes mechanical nouns got mixed in. Once, with all the gravitas in the world, I stared into the eyes of a gray-haired sexagenarian and declared the bouquet of his wine to be composed of burnt tires. Again, he agreed with me. Place affects the taste of wine, both the place where wine is drunk and the place where wine is made. The soil, the weather, and the elevation of the wine's birthplace infuses it with some of the more mysterious elements of its character, referred to as the wine's terroir. The taste of wine can also be bent by the culture and atmosphere of the place of consumption. Taste is a timorous, ephemeral notion. In Mississippi, the actual taste of the wine blended into my prejudices. To me, all the wine tasted the same at the same dinners with the same people having the same discussions reflecting the same values. I use the wine mad libs both as a tool to help me conform as well as a subversive weapon I could use to occasionally poke at the sameness without ever really changing it. Some five years later, I found myself in a new place. When I moved to Houston after college, I eventually ended up behind a bar making my rent money selling wine. I'd answered a Craigslist ad with a black and white photo of me drinking wine. It turned me into a professional. My new job was at the freshly opened Nina's on 9th, a bar on one of the upscale residential side streets near Rice University. The owner, Cassie, had converted a 1920s bungalow into a place where a person could spend nearly $20 on three ounces of alcohol sloshing around a conical glass. Blooming jasmine tendrils encircled the front patio, and the scent of flowers on humid spring nights hung all over us, Cassie decorated the walls inside with artwork by a local female artist. The canvases depicted naked women wraiths in various draping poses clinging to themselves. The painting of a girl across from the bar. The painting I ended up looking at for hours on end as I poured wine into glasses under light so caramel warm that it made the liquid seem to move in slow motion. The painting I heard endless comments about from enchanted customers stared straight back into my eyes with the haunted look and the jutting ribs of a Holocaust survivor. Josh's Mad Lib didn't work at Nina's on 9th. Cassie gave me binders full of photocopied information to learn about wine, beer, and liquor, but especially about wine. Whether or not I could actually taste them, there were certain tastes that I was expected to match to certain wines. The French whites from the Loire Valley were minerally. The California Chardonnays were buttery. Somewhere inside all of those pages, I learned that the butteriness in the wine was matched to a scientific process called malolactic fermentation. 
I still believed wine tasting to be a myth, but I respected the science behind malolactic fermentation. So, no more Mad Libs. I matched only the proper descriptors to the proper wines. My first week at work, Cassie asked me to stock the Bordeaux display case and learn from the labels what I could about the wines we served. Not all Bordeaux were created equal. The Bordeaux from the right bank, like the blue label Saint-Emilion we carried, had a higher percentage of Merlot grapes in the blend, whereas the Bordeaux from the left bank had a higher percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. There was a difference between old world wines and new world wines, a distinction that translates as wines from the lands of the colonizer and the wines from the lands of the colonized. The colonizer wines came with the highest prestige, and the French left bank Bordeaux had the highest prestige of all. That's where the Grand Cru were situated in all their splendor, deemed to be the best five Bordeaux by Napoleon Bonaparte himself. But all of that prestige and class and show-offery and cultured weight came from the label, not the taste. It was the label that the older rich customer would showcase to the young woman he was trying to impress, and it was the alcohol and the atmosphere of the bar that he would rely on to help him sleep with her. The taste of the wine was still part of the performance, even though the performance itself had changed. The customers at the wine bar were better informed than the wine drinkers of Mississippi, but I was convinced that none of them could distinguish our house red from Bordeaux, much less a ripe bank Chateau Margaux from a Saint-Emilion. As I was reverently placing bottles from across the Atlantic on the shelf, I heard one of the regular customers behind me say my name to Cassie. So, he said and sloshed his wine glass in my general direction. How's the new girl? I looked over my shoulder. Both of them were looking at me, scanning my clothes, my face, my expression, my label. Well, Cassie said as she looked into my eyes and chose her descriptor. She's trainable. I wasn't so sure about that. One afternoon, one of our wine representatives, Jeremy, came into the bar with a bearded stranger. Nina's on ninth was still empty. The two of them sat down on bar stools, and Jeremy introduced me to the bearded companion. This is Marco, he said. He's a winemaker from Oregon. He pointed at one of the open Pinot Noir bottles on the shelf behind me. That's his wine. I'm just taking him around, showing him the Houston wine sites. Nice to meet you. I stopped chopping fruit and shook Marco's hand over the bar. Now we both smelled like lemons. I think we can both agree that Marco's Pinot Noir is a beautiful wine, Jeremy said. Wine reps seem to be just as incapable of tasting the differences between wines as the rest of humanity. Jeremy called every wine he represented beautiful. He drew out the word and lacquered it with enough syrupy layers of emphasis that I recognized it as a convenient veil to hide his ignorance. The word beautiful was Jeremy's more abstract and simplistic version of my own retired Mad Libs. People could argue with a mushroom aftertaste, but they couldn't argue with Jeremy's perception of beauty. Very beautiful, I said. We sell a lot of it. I filled wine glasses. The sun began to set and more people wandered in. Cassie's atmospheric electric jazz softened the elapse of time. Spindly threads of light from the Edison bulbs suspended around the room glowed on the patio and into the thick Houston night air. Something about Marco's graying beard and dirty fingernails threw me off, made me start to re-examine my prejudices. He looked like a farmer, not a wine snob. I asked him if he could taste differences in wine. Of course I can taste different wines. He smiled, and the sunned skin around his eyes wrinkled. I waited for a lull between wine orders and set down two glasses in front of him. Each glass had a small amount of red wine swirling in the bottom. One of these wines is your wine, and one of them is something else. Which is which? The two red liquids looked nearly identical in the dim light. By now, I knew how to differentiate between some wines based on sight. A Pinot Noir usually has more clarity than other reds, 
They filter less light and cast a more vibrant red shadow. Marco smiled at me. He took a drink of water and buried his nose in the first glass and inhaled deeply. This is mine, he said without even tasting. Then he breathed in the second glass. This is a blend, probably French, he sipped. Bordeaux? If it's Bordeaux, it's heavy on the Merlot. I had chosen the blue-labeled Santa Millon Right Bank Bordeaux. My eyes widened. My doubt was shaken. You probably saw the difference in the color. Maybe you saw me open the bottle. Marco laughed and shook his head. It's a Santa Millon, I told him. Okay, let's go again. Try something harder this time. Now Marco's eyes were lit up with the glow of the challenge. I went into the back cooler and found another open red wine that was identical to the Santa Millon. A California Meritage. California winemakers had modeled the Meritage blends as a tribute to old world wine blends, Bordeaux in particular. If Marco could differentiate these two wines, then on some level, under all the classist smoke and mirrors, wine tasting had to be real. Rare, but real. I set the two glasses in front of him. Each wine was exactly the same temperature. Marco tasted the Santa Millon again. This is similar or the same as the Bordeaux you gave me earlier. Then he smelled and tasted the Meritage. Another red blend. This is getting harder. But this one is from California. And it has more Cabernet than the first. So few times in life does the mythical imaginary turn out to be real. Long after Marco had returned to his own terroir in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest, I marveled at what he had revealed to me. In the quiet moments of my life, I reorganized what I understood as true. As I walked my dog down neighborhood sidewalks broken into chunks of cement by the roots of oak trees, as I drove to work under the freeway to the rich side of town, as I stared into the empty eyes of the painted wraith when the wine bar was slow, I continued the work of revising and humbling myself. Many times through the living of my life, faith had grown into doubt. The true had become false. But now, the false had become true. One thing was certain. Now that I believed wine tasting to be real, I wanted to learn how to do it. I tasted and thought about all the wines I could. Sometimes I would be sure that I had trained myself to identify two different wines, but the memory of the taste would fall from my mind in an hour or a day. My certainty that I had captured the memory of the taste of Zinfandel melted away the next day when I misidentified a San Giovese as a Zinfandel. I knew all the words and facts and origins, but I was unable to match them to anything real and the abstract information seemed useless without being able to match it to an actual concrete wine. The next week, Jeremy came by to drop off a shipment of wine. He wheeled in boxes on a dolly and set them on the stained concrete floor. How do people learn how to taste, Jeremy? I asked him. He slid the dolly out from under the wine, and I cut through the packing tape of a box with the foil cutter on my wine key. You're going to need descriptors, Jeremy said. Right, I need words? Yeah, words. You need a word, but the word alone isn't enough. You need to have an actual sensory memory of the smell and taste that word represents. Think about a black currant. That word is written all over the backs of red wines. It's a very popular descriptor. But how many black currants have you actually eaten? Do you really know what a black currant tastes like? I shook my head. I wasn't even sure what a black currant looked like. If you want to be able to taste wine, here's what you do. Go to the produce section of a fancy grocery store. Smell every single piece of produce they have. Pick up the currants, smell the currants, and say the word to yourself, currant. 
Train your mind to fuse that word and that smell. After you've smelled all the different types of mushrooms and potato skins and scratched the skin of a pomegranate, go to the bulk section. Smell and name every single spice. Cardamom, caraway, tarragon. Skip the salt. Smell the nuts. Smell the difference between smoked almonds and raw almonds. By now, you've probably gotten yourself kicked out of the fancy grocery store. Go to the park. Go to the forest. Smell cut grass. Smell wood. Smell the difference between wet wood and dry wood. Go to a lumber yard and smell oak and linden and ash, especially the oak. Smell dirt and mud. There are different smells to different kinds of dirt, you know. Smell charcoal. Smell tobacco in an unsmoked cigar. Me, I'm a mineral junkie. I love the smell of wet rocks and slate in a glass of white wine. After Jeremy's advice, I did not go and get myself kicked out of a gourmet grocery store. Instead, I started with the smells in my own kitchen. As I cooked pasta sauce, I crumbled up dry oregano in my hands and said to myself, oregano. My regular grocery store flushed with early summer blueberries and strawberries, and I bought them and named each of the flavors to myself as I ate them. I raked the backyard, and I named the smell of decomposing leaves to myself. My ability to taste wine didn't change, but I noticed that I could more easily identify different ingredients in foods cooked by someone else. As the weather heated up, Cassie started ordering more white wines. The first time I tasted our New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, a buried memory glowed back to life. The memory started as a still portrait of myself, much shorter, looking up at a wall of brightly colored candy in plastic bins. I was at the candy shop in Hickory Ridge Mall in South Memphis, Tennessee, and I was maybe seven or eight. I knew that one of the bins tasted like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. The bin filled with raspberry and blackberry jelly candies covered with black and red candy seeds. I hadn't eaten or thought about that candy in years, but the memory was there inside of me, as vivid as a fire burst. Pulling up a dormant memory can sometimes loosen and reawaken other memories. Movement flowed into my still life memory of the candy store, and I remembered picking out a piece of citrine from the bins of semi precious stones in the nature store in the same mall. Me, lying on my bed looking at the rock and wondering how or why it was divided into three different layers. My citrine had a gray layer, a white layer, and a gold crystal layer. And I wrote a story an origin story to explain how the different layers of citrine grew in response to the emotions of a captured princess. The golden crystals formed when she escaped to freedom. That was the first time I truly tasted a wine. In a blind taste test, I knew that I could identify a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Only a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc has the bouquet of a candy shop jelly raspberry in the 90s, a current of semi-precious gemstones, and the aftertaste of a girl in a tower knitting together her own freedom. At first, you try to translate tastes into words for yourself and your own memory, attempting to graft new knowledge onto already existing structures and stories in your mind. Trying to remember smells and tastes in a glass of wine is like trying to hold smoke in your hands. You have to create a vessel inside yourself to store the taste in, a vessel made out of words or memories or both. Once you've built your taste memory out of language, you have a chance of communicating a taste to another person. Many times I have seen a wine descriptor change a person's experience. The way a semillon tastes for a customer is different from the way a semillon tastes for the same customer after hearing the word peaches. The classic way to go about this translation process is to use those descriptors, which are analogies with other smells and tastes already present in the memory. Then we can use these descriptive metaphors to communicate tastes. They range from the general to the specific, from fruity to green apple. 
The ground level real world kitchen and life descriptors are my favorite. Green apple means so much more than fruit. Robert Parker, my favorite wine reviewer, rates wines in The Wine Advocate. He uses all these descriptors, but he also uses a kind of imagist poetry that feels closer to my New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc memory method of flavor categorization. I learned about Robert Parker through my brother Josh. Around the time that the usefulness of Josh's mad lib expired for me, Josh became a certified sommelier. Overnight, he stopped ridiculing serious wine drinkers and became the most serious wine drinker of all. One day, he brought a 2009 Ponte Canet Bordeaux for us to share. He sent me a link to Robert Parker's wine review, in which Parker described the wine as black as a moonless night. Parker planted an image in our minds. Senses jumble together in this type of description, and suddenly you can find yourself drinking a painting or tasting another person's memory. Landscapes, concertos, skydiving. They can all fit in a bottle of wine. The third way to use language to taste wine is also the oldest. Personification, the human analogy. Ever since Dionysus, people have been used to bringing the taste of wine to life. Descriptors like brawny, charming, elegant, edgy, nervy, sassy. These words indicate different bouquets and flavors in a bottle of wine. And the same words also describe different sorts of human characteristics. Wines age and change, in the casks, in the bottle, and even in the glass. Like people, wines mature. One day, Cassie asked me to help update the cocktail menu for summertime. All the jasmine flowers were shriveling in the growing heat and Cassie wanted to replace the heavily spiced winter drinks with something greener and lighter. I brought a thrift store book with me, the 1971 edition of Playboy's Host and Bar Book by Thomas Mario. My copy was inscribed, To Jim, XO, Susan. May 24, 1972, in blue cursive pen. I mixed a minted gin, muddled orange, lemon, sugar, and fresh mint with gin. A perfect drink for unwinding after 18 holes on the fairway, according to Thomas Mario. Cassie tasted it. It's good, she said, but I've been wanting a drink with fresh basil. Try one with basil and change the name. By the time the basilica was born and perfected, we were both drunk. Jeremy came in to drop off some more wine, and I made him one too. This is good, he checked his watch. I've got to go check on some stock in the caves. Care to join me, he asked. The caves, I asked. No scoffs. It's an underground wine storage facility just down the road. I rent a temperature-controlled unit there. It's basically my office. Let's go, I said. Two blocks east past the expensive beautician, past the half mansion on the corner, one block north, and we were at the caves. From the outside, in the dazzling afternoon sunshine, the building looked like a small warehouse. Jeremy opened the front door with a key code and revealed the set of stairs leading down. Down we went, from sunlight into shadow, from day into night. The stairs ended in a large, windowless room. My eyes adjusted, and I saw a few people sitting around a low table on leather couches, drinking wine and eating cheese. Hey, Rod, Margaret, Jeremy said. Jeremy, join us, Margaret said. We have plenty of cheese, and Arnold just opened a big California red. Bring your friend. Jeremy put on his serious wine-drinking demeanor. Sure. And I have just the thing, a coat de Rhone. You'll love it. We'll be right back. I followed him down more stairs, which brought us to a heavy steel door. Jeremy placed his thumb on a black square on the wall, and the door clicked open. 
Did that thing just read your thumbprint? I asked. Yep. He reached up just inside the doorway and grabbed two ski jackets with fur-lined hoods from the rack on the wall. Here, you're going to need this. They keep it cold down here. I slid my bare arms into the puffy jacket. My breath came out as a white fog. I feel like I just fell down a rabbit hole and ended up in James Bond's retirement home. Rod Sanders is here, Jeremy said. He spun a wheel lock and his wine locker opened. That man is a serious wine collector. With the right bottle, we could probably get him to open something fantastic. Jeremy's hands fluttered between two bottles of red. This should do it. We climbed back up the stairs and settled ourselves onto one of the leather couches around the low table. The room was painted in the same dark burgundies and greens as the background of the wraith painting at the bar. Nice to meet you. With a diamond-encrusted hand, Margaret set a wine glass in front of me and filled it with inky dark wine. Nice to meet you. Our glasses clinked and I drank. She watched me. How do you like it? She asked, gems twinkling in the dim light as she turned back to her own glass. I looked into her eyes. This, I said with all the gravity I had available to me, is a beautiful wine. I felt Jeremy smile beside me. He popped the cork on his bottle. I offered Margaret more. Supple, bright, just acidic enough. A beautiful wine. Like Jeremy, whose blind confidence I mimicked, I was now a salesman, bartering words for my place at the dark table. Margaret smiled. Jeremy disappeared behind a counter and reemerged with clean glasses. He poured wine for everyone. Here's a little something for us. To celebrate being alive on Sunday afternoon. Is it afternoon already? Rod said. What a lovely bottle, Jeremy. Margaret said, eyeing the label. She sipped the new glass. Reminds me of something I brought back from Piedmont. I'll go get it. Margaret disappeared into the icy bowels of the caves and returned with another bottle of wine and more fresh glasses. Barolo, she said, and passed it around. Cheers. Wonderful, wonderful, Rod said. You can taste the age on this one. It's just starting to mellow out around the edges. My turn. I'll be right back. Rod Sanders got up to retrieve his wine. This is it, Jeremy whispered, his voice laced with greed and excitement. Who cleans all these glasses? I whispered back. As a bartender, I spent a lot of my life cleaning glasses. Maria, Margaret called. A lady in a white apron appeared. Could you please clear away some of this? Wordlessly, Maria removed 20 spent glasses from the low table, placed them on a tray, and went away again. Rod came back and set up another round of clean wine glasses. This one hasn't quite aged long enough, I imagine. It'll probably be a bit tannic, but I don't want to wait to taste it. Rod popped the cork out of the mouth of the bottle. I feel as though I'm slaying a virgin. Wine flowed into glasses. Here you are, Annie. Taste it. The wine scratched and clawed at the inside of my mouth. Rod was right. This wine wasn't ready. It hasn't really opened up yet, I said. You know, you have to be something of a poet to talk about wine. Tell me about the wine, Annie. What do you taste? I gathered the tattered shreds of my focus and drank some more. I could feel a dormant memory stirring back to life, a memory of my own. I forced it up into the surface of my conscious mind. It tastes like Sweden, like a meal I had there once. Wild boar and cranberry sauce, tart and gamey. Rod stared at me. Fruit and meat, I said. Rod Sanders gazed into the garnet lights of his glass. You're very young, very young. He looked up mournfully and swallowed some more of the virgin he had slain. I drank some more of my memory of Sweden with my unpoetic tongue. Isn't it a shame, Rod said. 
Isn't it a shame that the young have taste buds that are fully alive, but the young don't have the experience to know how to use them? And isn't it a shame that the old have the knowledge and the awareness needed, but the taste buds of the old are already starting to die? Isn't it a tragedy? There he sat, the man unable to experience life the way he wanted, either lacking the knowledge or the physical ability to taste his surroundings. There I sat across from him, startled at the label he hung around my neck. He was wrong about me. I had everything I needed to taste. Here's something that's true about accessing sensory memories. The more times a memory is accessed, the less vibrantly the memory plays out. You can't access a memory without adding onto it and changing it in some way. A memory is the most powerful the first time it stirs back to life. If you access it over and over again, it begins to get washed out and turns into a memory of a memory. It begins to grow and evolve with the rememberer. Once, when a chef friend and I were eating oysters at an outdoor cafe, he told me his best oyster eating memory. He was traveling through the south of Spain, learning about food and gathering the culinary credibility he would later need to open high-end restaurants back in Houston. He met a beautiful girl, and they decided to visit Morocco together. On the beach, they came across a leathery old woman selling oysters. The chef somehow bridged the language gulf and ordered several dozen oysters from the lady's stall. The old lady took off her shoes, grabbed a metal bucket, and swam out into the bay to harvest the oysters. The chef stood amazed for a few moments before he sprang into action. We have to eat these oysters with a bottle of wine. It's the only way. He left the beautiful girl to wait for the old woman and raced around the village from store to store, looking for a bottle of wine to drink with the oysters. Bottles of wine weren't as easy to come by in Morocco as they were in Spain. But eventually, the chef returned to the beach with a bottle of dry white wine just as the old woman emerged from the sea with a metal bucket of oysters. She shucked them, they paid, and the chef and the beautiful girl sat down in the sand and drank warm white wine and oysters that tasted of the living waters of the Mediterranean Sea. It's one of my best memories, the chef said. I don't like to think about it very often because I don't want to ruin it. I understood. The chef didn't want the vibrancy of the memory to fade with the retelling and the reliving. And he had just burned through one of his relivings to share it with me. By now, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc didn't taste like candy store raspberry jellies and citrine anymore. It just tasted of itself. I'd drunk so many glasses of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc that the place in my memory where the taste lived was now made from all the times I had drunk it and cooked with it. Thank you for telling me, I said. What I have gained from the drinking and thinking about many glasses of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is a framework of taste that I can use as a reference to new tastes, a taste language. For my 34th birthday, Josh brought me a couple of bottles of wine. I buried my nose in a 2010 Gigondas and found my descriptor, peppery. When the Gigondas was pressed, I still believed in the power of wine-mad libs as I grappled with the waywardness of my life's direction. I had yet to learn that wine could actually be tasted. Josh drank some. There's pepper in this one, he said. That's what I thought, I replied. Josh opened a 14-year-old bottle of 2005 Bordeaux. When this wine was pressed, I was still stumbling around France learning to navigate a new language and a new culture as the boundaries around what I knew to be the world unfurled. Josh breathed in the wine. Whoa, he said. He handed me a glass. What about this one? I inhaled the rich darkness of the wine. Figs, I said. Yes, figs, exactly, he replied. I tasted the wine. The bouquet tasted like my own wonder at sharing something as ephemeral and personal as the scent of a wine. The current had the textured flow of growth and time and finished with an aftertaste of red wine. Just what I asked for. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Pen Dust Radio. For more information or to submit your writing to the podcast, please visit pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com.